Here's what we're going to do today. We're going to work on leadership. And leadership doesn't mean that you have to be the boss and boss people around. It could mean that you want to have a greater impact in the work that you do, in the community you live in, in this unbelievable community. We could talk more about that. Or just for yourself. Because we're going to work on leading self today. I'm going to give you the roots of it. And if you're a Grateful Dead fan, you know the illusion I've just made. And we are going to practice the best way adults learn, as you know, is by doing. So that's why I'm asking you to sit with somebody. We're going to work on a few things together, kind of like appetizers. So as soon as you get into it, you will see me waving wildly that it's time to stop talking. And we'll do that over and over again till you get mad enough at me that we can stop. And then I'll give you a few resources at the end. If you're curious to learn more, there's a lot on the web that you can do, and books if you like to read, and the neighbor that you just met. Hopefully, you're sitting next to somebody you don't even know, and we'll get into that in a minute. So where does this come from? I am going to start by giving you a story of myself, very briefly. I'm an old lady. I woke up in my 50th year, and I felt empty, which made no sense. I had been a partner in uh, McKinsey, which is a worldwide consulting firm, for uh, a long time. I had a husband I still love. I have two beautiful children, daughters, amazing. I lived in an apartment in New York City, if you're ever there. It faces the park, it's pretty nice. And I have a farm. Yes, I have cows and chickens and goats and sheep and all kinds of stuff. And so I wake up in my 50th year and I feel empty. And worse than that, I felt invisible. And you might think, why is she wearing such a colorful dress if she feels invisible all the time? And it's because the organizer said there would be a black curtain here and not to wear black because you would be invisible then. <laughs> okay, so I wake up on this day and I go to my husband, David, who is an ex-Israeli paratrooper. You kind of know what that looks like. And I say, I feel empty. And David says, why don't you buy yourself a pair of shoes? So I go, yeah, I know. He, he says, and if I can say it in this audience, you're going through your changes. It's all going to be fine. <laughs> buy the shoes. I buy the shoes. Two weeks later, it comes back to me. Why do I feel this way? And I thought, it's because I'm not a leader. If I were a leader, you know, leaders tend to be like really pretty tall. They come into the room, they talk to each other, and they never even saw me. Uh, it could be because I am under five feet tall, I'm not sure. Or it could be something else. And I thought, I'm going to go and talk to these unbelievable successful women all over the world. And I'll talk to men leaders too. I will find out what they have that I am missing. And when I get that, I'm going to drink that and I'm going to share it with anybody who will listen. And David says, this is a great idea. You got to give this a name that will make the men think it's important. And so I decided to call it the Blair Witch Project um, <laughs> until I found out that somebody had already taken that name. So I broke a rule. I called it the McKinsey Centered Leadership Project. Why centered? We'll find out. I interviewed men and women all over the world. Here are a couple of pictures of some amazing people, including Christine Lagarde, now of the IMF, or uh, there's, that's John Donahoe, who briefly ran eBay, or Andrea Jung, who was now running Grameen Bank, who was running Avon at the time, and Wangeshi Mutu, who's an unbelievably talented artist from Kenya. And there was also a couple of other, well, there were 200. Now it's up to like 600 people. I keep interviewing people. I'm pretty shy, and I love to hear people's stories. And this is what came from that research. We did look at all the available research. If you're interested in leadership, you should know there are at least 350,000 books on the topic. Almost all of them are written by men for men, and uh, they're pretty good, I'm sure. But we also looked at evolutionary psychology and gender studies. We looked at 
all kinds of uh, psychology, positive psychology, and therein lies the secret, it's cross fields. We did a global survey with men and women from small, medium, and large companies who work and wanted to take this survey with us, and we found out that centered leadership is as good for all kinds of people as it is for women, and we've been in the field for over 15 years teaching it and proselytizing, and I proselytize because at its core, it's really quite simple. It's self-awareness, the ability to understand what is going on in myself right now, to be able to step back and pause to make a choice, to recognize that what is happening in me is my choice. I can practice with new skills and new tools and I can change if I choose or stay as I am. And if I do that simple thing, which takes a lifetime to learn, then I will have greater resilience, I will perform at a higher rate, and frankly, I will have more fulfillment. And that is what I learned. I learned that nothing was missing in me, but in fact, it was all there. I chose not to use it. And that why was it that I fell in love with every single person I interviewed and I saw their faults? I saw what limited them and it didn't stop me from loving them, but I couldn't do that at the time to myself. This is the gist of centered leadership, helping you to manage your thoughts, your feelings, and your actions in order to have a greater impact, not just on yourself, on the people around you, and on your organization or community. And there's nothing wrong with that. So it has five pieces, that's it. I couldn't remember these for the first year of doing this work, so if you don't remember it, that's okay, I'll be repeating this quite often. <laughs> and we'll go through each one, we'll taste it. Meaning, which is about living into your own strengths. And we'll do an exercise on that. Framing and reframing, which is about in the middle of an upset, stepping back to be curious about yourself. What is going on in me and the ability to shape shift? Connecting, building trust between people. We'll work on that. Engaging, which is taking risk and then owning that without self-blame and judgment. And then finally, energizing, because we all work and live so hard and we often forget that we are giving out energy all the time and we need to recover and renew and that's part of our responsibility. So we're gonna go through all of those and these five, it turns out, are the distinguishing factors between being a good leader or manager and a remarkable one. On my, on my book committee was a fellow no longer with us, Warren Bennis, the father of leadership. And he said to me, Joanna, how, why five? I mean, I wrote the books. I wrote 16 books, just so you don't forget. And there are 23 leadership traits. So how come you have just five? And I realized in that moment, this is the difference. This is not everything it takes to be a great leader, but these are the only things that matter. So why is that? It starts with you. Think of yourself and everybody you don't know in this room as an iceberg. So it's, it's chilly in here, right? And you see, you see and you judge. It's normal, it's human. You look at people and you say, what do they look like? What do they say or not say? What are they doing or not doing? And then we make a judgment. That's behavior. But just like you don't know anything about me and I don't know anything about you, Underneath the waterline are all these thoughts and feelings that we have that we never disclose. We're in a meeting and we suddenly get angry and we forget to say, I'm angry. We just bark at the other person. And then underneath that, sometimes we don't even know it about ourselves, are the mindsets, the values, the beliefs that we hold true, and then way at the bottom, beyond the grasp of most of us, and certainly, I don't know about you, and you don't know it about me, but that's who we really are. That is who we are at our deepest, most human being. What is it we need that we are not getting in the moment? That causes the behavior to shift, 
And so we're gonna work on just becoming curious about ourselves. And from there, we're gonna gain greater happiness, performance, resiliency. Pretty cool. So, are you with me so far? Okay. To do this, we have to take a small risk. And I promise you, no one will be hurt. And yes, you will be uncomfortable. You have to be uncomfortable because we're going to leave what makes us comfortable in order to learn and grow. OK. okay. <laughs> I got one lady with me. And what about the rest of you? <laughs> All right. So we have to withhold judgment about ourselves. And we have to enter an open space. So I'm going to do the scariest thing I'm going to do today, which is to ask everybody here to unwind our feet and our arms. If they're all wrapped up, just unwind them. Get your feet on the floor. If you're short like me, you might have to squidgy up, technical term. <laughs> and when you're ready, I'm going ahead of you. Please close your eyes. And take a deep breath in. Some of you know this from mindfulness. And an even deeper breath out. Let's do it again. And one more time. And start to feel yourself relaxing from the top of your head through the small muscles in your face. Feel any tension from today or home just dripping away. Feel your neck getting longer as your shoulders drop. Feel the tension flowing out through your arms and into your legs and through them, through your feet and into the floor. <coughs> Feel the floor and the chair holding you safe. And of course, our brains are always active. I invite you to bring your attention to your breathing, to the sensation of the air coming in and out of your nose, of your chest rising and falling. And you might feel your neighbor or hear a noise, and that's OK. Just gently and easily bring your attention back to your breathing. And so we go from our breath to our thoughts and gently back to our breath. And if you would be so kind, take a moment in this state and think back over the past year to a moment in your work or in your life where you were at a peak, at a high point, where everything was going your way, where you were filled with positive energy, where you were achieving impact in your work Take a moment and put yourself back and relive that experience. <clears throat> and in that moment, as you see yourself, what is it that you value most about yourself. Because what gives you positive energy and what you most value 
are your strengths. They are not your skills. When you're ready, eyes pointed at the floor, slowly, slowly open them up. Coming back into the room, picking your head up, looking around at all these amazing people, smiling because they're going to help you grow and you're helping them grow. If you like, take a stretch. And I'm going to invite you to spend literally three minutes talking to one neighbor about your strengths. Now, neighbor, you also will talk about your strengths. So for the very shy people in the room, I suggest you go first, because I do know from experience what happens. For three minutes, you are fully engaged in the other person. And then you say, oh, we're out of time. Look at that. I'll catch you later. <laughs> So really fast, top strengths, as you listen to your partner, if you hear skills, push deeper and say, tell me more. Go deeper than that. What lies underneath what you just said? Give it a try. Three minutes, I'll count. Let's go. This is the talking part. Wow. A lot of energy in this room. I don't have time to tell you what my strengths are, but I will the next time we meet, okay? If you know your strengths and you think about five or 10 minutes a day that you can use those strengths in your work, you will be amazed by what happens. If you're on a team and rather than complaining or feeling irritable about a team member, you start with that person's strengths, amazing things will happen. And if you start your project and start with what are we strong at, what are our strengths, then you will get to a different outcome. I have used this over and over again. On the individual level, strengths are an amazing energizer. On an organizational level, appreciative inquiry often gets us to solutions that we would not normally find. And those of you who are, have experienced it know the feeling. It's pretty, pretty cool. So let's go to the other side. This will be uncomfortable. And I'm not going to be here for more than two or three minutes, OK? So we're going to think about our darkest moment over the year. You don't even have to close your eyes. And if you're sitting next to the person that created the darkest moment for you <laughs> over the year, just look away. <laughs> Put yourself for a minute into the situation where you were not at your best. In fact, you could feel it, potentially. Go into the moment. Maybe you got angry. Maybe you felt sick. Maybe you felt nothing at all. But boy, it was horrific, and you can feel it today just remembering it. Has everybody got one experience over the year? If you can't find one at work, go home. If you have a teenage child at home, I know you will have found it. <laughs> and in that moment, ask yourself, what are you feeling physically and what are you feeling emotionally and in that moment what do you think is going to happen to you so everybody got something turn to your neighbors this could be done three or four or five no names not needed and just think about those three questions as you describe your very worst moment over the year what you're feeling physically, emotionally, and what you're thinking about. I'm going to stop you in three minutes. Go.
Ok! Okay, who had a really bad feeling? Physical feeling. Where's my mic runner? Where'd he go? All right, we're going to... Ah, there you go. Joe, who... Wave, wave your hand. Okay, there's a somebody in the back. The lady with a hat? Who, where is it? Bad feeling. Come on, let's do this. Come in the audience. People at the back usually have the worst feelings. So let's go back here. Okay, who had a bad feeling? Come on, come on. No, no. He did. Oh, not me. Oh, no. It's Just, personal. It's personal, but what did you feel? I don't need oh, to know I your felt, situation. I felt, my feeling was like a gut-wrenching feeling where I got ripped open and like Ooh. a scar, you know, Dude. and being used at the end of the day. Oh, and, I love it. Yeah, love it was pretty awful. It, I, it was oh. a combine of like death and love at the same time. Death and love. Yeah. Okay, stop and right there. Disruptive. Disruptive. Yeah, yeah gut-wrenching. Right. Okay, Is that who, all I, yeah. I love it. Thank right. you so much. Right. Who had a different Ooh. feeling? Okay, lady in the back. Nice. Right back here. This beautiful lady. I was numb. Numb. I, I felt very angry, like my insides were going to explode. Oh, yeah, yes. explosion. Yes. Nice. And emotionally, do you know what you were feeling? Anger. Anger. Yes. Beautiful. Thank you. Okay, let's go to this side of the room. Who had a completely different bad feeling? Okay, Josepha. Or Josepha. Uh, Josepha, yes. <laughs> um, I felt betrayed. Okay, how does that feel in your body? In my body, it feels like not being able to listen anymore, and also my hands hurt. Your hands hurt. Oh, Beautiful. Thing. Wait a minute, your hands hurt, and you put up a shield. Well, no, I just, okay. I, yeah, probably couldn't listen anymore. Yeah. <laughs> just like, nah. Listen to the hand. Yeah. And then right back here is Catherine. What were you feeling in your body? I was feeling very, very nauseated. Couldn't eat for a few days. Did you throw up? I did. Yeah. yeah, love it. Okay, <laughs> but over here. All right, one more on this side. Who had a completely different feeling? Here's a person in the purple sweater. I just felt like a failure. Well, like, wait a minute. What does that feel like physically? You just feel cold and just kind of <gasps> hopeless. Cold. That's a new one for me. I love it. And hopeless is the emotion. Awful. Let's give them a hand for explaining to us because they have, they have something that we need, which is they know what they're feeling. Some of you may have found this difficult and couldn't actually describe your physical feelings. I put you into an amygdala hijack situation. What does that mean? Physically, something should have been happening. Did anybody sweat? or get red, or just feel really hot. Yeah, I can see right now, hot, just like Ugh! Okay, some people get dizzy. Some people literally drain. Anybody feel like, God, I wasn't even there. Just draining into the floor, sort of like that. And some people just actually get sick. Did anybody cry or feel like they would cry? That often happens, it happens to me all the time. And some people feel it right here, get really tight or in your, heart area get really, really tight, a little bit like what the gentleman was saying, or even not being able to breathe. Knowing your physical symptom is extraordinary and you want to have that because that's your first warning that you're having an amygdala high check. A lot of people mistake physical feelings for emotional feelings. And particularly a lot of men tell me, I don't even know what I was feeling emotionally. So if you do, that's extraordinary because now you've got both clues. And the reason you want these is your brain in an amygdala hijack is not actually working. Your executive brain has stopped working. Why is that? Because the amygdala, which is a small organ near your hypothalamus, has sent adrenaline and cortisol through your veins into your body so that you can get away from danger because it does not know whether this is a dinosaur about to eat you or you're having emotional distress. Same thing to the amygdala. So you, if you know, then what can you do? You can pause. You can literally pause yourself. Hey, Joanna, I'm having an amygdala hijack right now. <laughs> I feel the pit in my stomach and I feel my heart beating. So let me just close my eyes, hard to do in a large McKinsey meeting, and breathe 
In Japan, they do this. If you can't do that, there are some things that you can do. Physical things you can do is just exhale. It's really interesting that we all breathe without thinking about it most of the time. When we're hijacked, we forget to breathe. And that can be dangerous. So just exhaling, naturally breath will come in. Oxygen will fill your body. And in about 10 seconds, your executive brain will begin to function. Mine takes much longer. And you can do what your grandmother told you to do, which is to count to 10. If you can't do that, then you can do something physical. You can take a sip of water. You can feel your feet on the floor, your butt in the chair, and say to yourself, I am safe. And that's usually enough to do it. One person told me she pushes her chair away from the, de the desk to get distance. Anything you can do to waste 10 seconds and give yourself that time, which feels very long, but actually isn't, because everybody else is also having an amygdala hijack. When you're having a conflicting meeting, you're not the only one. If you can, ask a question. You can do it silently in your head. You can do it out loud. So you can ask yourself, what can I learn here? What's going on for me and for the others? What is it I truly want to create? And when you get your question, it becomes your mantra. I'll give you an example. So I'm a, I was a consultant for 32 years, which is ridiculous. I used to be six foot tall, and now you look at me. I'm a shadow of my former self. And I went to a giant retailer to do a supply chain study. Anybody here from production or supply chain or trained in that area would know it's a skill. I mean, you really need to know something. And I knew nothing about supply chain, which is why I brought a team of 10 people, all supply chain experts. And we were sitting underground, no windows, with a giant light beaming on this table and a huge screen right behind me that was beaming that horrible light Whatever that's, you know, that, sort of like that. And we had to wait. We're waiting for the client to come in. They told us 90 minutes, and then your arch enemy is going to come in after you to present because it's a competition. So I'm there. I've briefed everybody. I'm the most senior person. And then they file in, literally, the C's. You know the C's, the CEO, the CIO, the CMO, the CFO, the other C's, I don't know who they are, and then behind them all the direct reports, and behind them people they must have taken off the street. There were 30 people in that room, and then it started. I, I, I gave my bid, I explained what we were going to do, and, and you know, 89 of the 90 minutes go by, and I'm thinking, I'm going to get out of here alive. This is good. I don't really know where the exit is and how to get out of here. So it started. You know what this is, right? What is this? The downward spiral. It always goes down for some reason. So it starts. A guy, I'm just going to call him John to protect his innocence or not, says, I just have one question for Joanna. Uh, Uh-oh is right. And I say, oh, my God, I don't know what question he's going to ask, but I don't know the answer. How would I even know I don't know the answer? This starts to go. And it, it's getting a little bit faster. And he goes, Joanna. And I just thought, that tone, he's going for me. He's got his big guns out now. He says, when you said supply chain was a competitive strategic advantage in the first two or three minutes of this meeting, I'm thinking, what the what did I say? In the, I don't remember what I said in meeting two of this meeting. What does that even mean, strategic advantage? I don't know. He says, what did you mean by that? And then it goes. Then I'm going down, and I'm going, I can't think of anything. I can't even, my brain's not working. And that little voice, do you have one in your head? That little voice starts, and it goes, Joanna, can't you think of something to say? You need to be talking now. <laughs> They're going to think you're stupid. <laughs> They're going to think you're stupid because you are stupid. And this is way rumination works. It gets a hold of me, and I think my husband doesn't love me anymore. I yelled at my children. I'm a horrible mother, and I'm really down at the bottom. 60 eyes staring at me. 
this is going to be good, they say, because I'm stuck. I am literally having the fight, flight, freeze. I'm a freezer, right? You can't see me now because I'm frozen. <laughs> Animals can't see unless you move, except for humans for some reason. <laughs> so it is with huge effort that I pull myself up. Tears are literally, I can't even see. The, my eyeglasses are wet. And I say the dumbest thing I have ever said in my consulting career. I say, if you don't put product on the shelf, people can't buy them. <laughs> and they all look away. It's like, oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> And then my team comes up to me, and they have such concern in their eyes that I am now crying, and I just run out, and I run literally. I'm underground somewhere. I'm running, I'm running, I'm running to get to a car. I get to my car, I get in the car, I call my husband, I tell him what happens, and he says, don't cry, you're a million bucks. And I say, that's not enough money to do anything in New York City. <laughs> He says, okay, a hundred million bucks. <laughs> I literally dream about it. Three weeks later, I call the CEO. We get the study. I'm sure you're relieved. And I fire myself. That's what amygdala hijacks do. We literally make our worst fears come true. We can stop that by learning to pause. And reframe. Reframe from problem to solution. But in the interest of time, we'll stop with the shrimp and move on to the beef. I'd like you to think about trust. Think of somebody in your community or at home or at work, whatever you do, a customer, supplier, who you do not trust at all. No names. Think about what it is about this person you do not trust. One defining characteristic. Everybody got one? Without telling me who the person is, because he or she is not in this room, I'm pretty clear, they are not in this room, just shout it out to get it out of your body. Just shout it out, one, two, three. Oh, come on, people. I'm going to try that again. The defining characteristic, like evil. One, two, three, shout it. Love that. Okay, worst thing I'm going to tell you. I promise, it's all up from here. The characteristic that you just shouted out is also in you. Yikes. We see it, we have it, we own it. So think about something you admire about anyone. Could be a family member, a historic member, somebody from a movie, somebody from work. Just think about this person you truly admire and what is the defining characteristic you admire about them. That's also in you. If you see it, you have it. So what is trust? Trust is the ability to do four things. First, we all care about reliability. If you're creating a project and somebody is not delivering what they promised, it puts you and everybody around you in a difficult position. So we tend to take that for granted. So the, it's only one element of trust, but it's usually the first thing people think of, which is don't make promises you can't keep. So if anybody said this person just lets me down every time. That's reliability. The second one, humanity's favorite. I don't care if I'm in China, Kuwait, California, or South Africa. People hate individuals who are not congruent, which means that what they say, what they believe, what they do have to be aligned. People hate that about an individual who has a hidden agenda, who's really out for themselves, but actually pretends I'm, I'm totally for the team. Like it's all about us, right? As long as I'm the best. 
We hate that about people. Openness. This is a really interesting one. I typically find more men than women are afraid to be open because a lot of people think about openness as weakness, and it's actually not. Openness is not telling people what your partner said to you the other day and that you kicked the dog out of anger or that you had a terrible dinner. Openness is your ability to say, this is what I'm thinking and feeling. These are my limitations. This is what I'm concerned about. And getting that out on the table, particularly if you're the project leader, or if you're talking to a customer or a supplier. The last one, acceptance, is really interesting that more women than men tend to fall short on acceptance. And I have found both men and women have, uh, if you are the kind of person who was an A++ student in school, who's striving for perfection, anybody in the room like that? There must be at least one. Yeah, I see, like the hands are like, that's me. It was definitely me, definitely me. You know who you are because you're ashamed when you're not up at 105 for a test that was only graded to 100. Right? Or you are ashamed when somebody says it was all good except for. Now, I am married to a person who wings it, who you know, routinely got C's and D's in subjects he didn't care about because he's a mathematician. That's the only thing he cares about. So a lot of you probably are very self-accepting if you're like that person. So what acceptance is is the ability to withhold judgment to accept that if you're not going, doing a good job, I might have to let you go, but I still care about you as a human being. I'm gonna still treat you with dignity. Acceptance is something that we can practice doing. So you know when a person is not accepting, they criticize, they micromanage. Know that they're doing it to themselves more than that they're doing it to you. It starts with self. So if this is you, if acceptance is something you'd like to get stronger at, then there is one small assignment. And if it's your kid, this is an important assignment as well, which is each night before you go to bed, ask yourself what's one new thing you appreciate about yourself. Just one new thing. And if you put it in a journal, they will add up over the weeks and months. And you will begin to retrain your brain to appreciate. Because appreciation trumps judgment. And then you turn to your coworkers and start with what do you actually appreciate about them? And what we're doing is we're re releasing love, kindness, and generosity. It's what you start with, even though you could be irritated and frustrated by the lack of progress on the project. If you do these four things, you build trust. So rather than asking, why don't I trust you, reframe that question to be, what can I do to get you to trust me more? How can I inspire you to trust me? And the person will usually tell you, and they, one of these four things is important to them. Like at McKinsey, nobody cares about anything other than reliability. So there are a lot of backstabbing people there because it's not important to them. It might be really important to you. So be sure to tell people on your team, this is what builds trust with me, and now I want to know how to build your trust in me. Okay, two more to go. Think about your next biggest challenge or opportunity, if you're an opportunity-based person, and one of you in the pair will get free coaching, and one of you will learn the secrets of being a great coach. So you figure it out between the two of you. Before I give you your time, the person who's going to get the coaching, we want you to just think about the upsides. If I meet this challenge, if I take on this opportunity, what becomes possible for me? And what more? And what more? Just that upper left-hand box. And when you really sorted that out, Think about the lower right-hand box and what is the downside of doing nothing, of staying as I am. So the people who want to coach, here's the secret. First, 
You just look really sincere. <laughs> Usually like this. And all you have to do is go, tell me more. You obviously know the answer. Keep it to yourself. Let the person do their own problem solving. And just go, and what else? That's it. So you get free coaching. You get to practice being a coach. You get four minutes. Find your pair and go. What we're doing is retraining our brains to start with the upside. Some of you are optimists, and so you start with the upside. Anybody here consider themselves an extreme optimist? Yeah. For you guys, sleep at it for 24 hours. Because if you start with the upside and nobody's holding you back, so you have two choices, either to go to sleep and really look at it in the morning or have a pessimist by your side. So you're a little bit different in that you always start with the upside and you never see the downside. And in fact, you always see the downside of not doing anything. You're very fast in this particular exercise. For you, a pre-mortem is a beautiful thing. Bring your four most pessimistic friends together and they know who they are, um, <laughs> Eeyore and all his pals, and then have them sit together and tell them your idea and have them tell you the worst thing that could happen, short of Martians coming down on Earth, something that has a 2% black swan probability, and then figure out how to mitigate those things. And then you're ready, you're good to go. Because optimism is a wonderful thing. A lot of us work to gain that that skill, if you have it, it's a gift, you have it. So you can retrain your brain. And in fact, those of us who don't think of the upside have voices in our head, and those who only think of the upside have different voices in our head. So does anybody hear the critic in, in their head? It's a little voice, usually your mother, and <laughs> constantly talking to you. Like with me, it would be, oh, have you gained weight? Right? It's just, it's always something. It's always something. So uh, voices are actually a serious business. If you read pop psychology, they tell you to shut the voice up, and it doesn't work. The more you try to suppress a voice, the louder it will talk until you act out. So for everybody, for coaches and for coachees, think about this. Think about your opportunity or your challenge. And here are these voices in turn. So what is that coach? Even if you were not an athlete in high school, you can imagine a coach from all of the movies you've undoubtedly seen. What voice in your head can coach you? What is the coach telling you? Take 30 seconds, think about your challenge and hear the voice. The coach might be telling you, yeah, I know it's hard, and I know you don't know what to do, and that's okay, because the only way you're going to get better is by doing it. What is the wise person? I particularly am a Yoda fan. What does Yoda say about this challenge? What does Yoda say? You know what Yoda says, right? Any Yoda aficionados here? You are? Yes, in the voice. <laughs> there is no try. I'm not green, I know. I'm trying my best here, guys. There is do and do not, right? Or is it or? It's, I think it's do or do not. Do or do not. Hear a voice of a wise person in your head to help you with your challenge. Hear a visionary. Maybe you're the visionary. Hear your voice. Hear the voice. Wow. You will probably fail. But if you do this thing and it works, that's going to be unbelievable. Isn't that exciting? Doesn't that fill you with energy? Just thinking about the way the world could be with your new project. And then hear the critic. Hear the critic on the loudspeaker with everybody else. A client literally in her office put four chairs and a fifth chair. You, you can try this at home 
If, because none of you work in an office with glass, right? Glass cubbies. If you work in an office where everybody in the office can see you, then try it at home. You do. <laughs> Five minutes. Don't you worry. <laughs> Don't you. So, in your chair, be you. In the other four chairs, move yourself to each chair. I kid you not. And be the voice and say it out loud. As you go through each of the four voices, listen to what you're saying because you're telling yourself a truth and then go back to your own chair and recognize that you are not your voices. You're just the author of those voices. You are you and those voices can help you. Some people are really good about getting their own board of directors, not imaginary people you trust, but they're going to tell you stuff that's good for them. These voices are there to protect and help you, and they exist whether you hear them or not, so use them. And if it's your critic, buy them some jewelry. <laughs> what can I say? Okay, energizing. Everybody a little like worn out by me at this point? Usually this is the case. Think about your four sources of energy. Think about physically, you've been sitting still, pretty still for a while. How active and healthy are you in general and in this moment in your mind? How focused are you right now? How alert and present are you in this room? Think about your heart. You've had some conversations that are pretty deep with somebody sitting next to you who you may or may not know. And that connection is generally of the heart. And then spiritually, even if you are not a religious person, you are a spiritual person. So are you, in fact, investing in what matters for you, in what's important to you? As you think about your energy, just give yourself a score. Every 90 minutes, just like computers, we go to sleep. Asleep at the switch, we need to wake it up. We need to wake it up, and we can wake it up in a number of ways. And I'm going to do one quick exercise. You ready? You with me? Yes. Okay, everybody stand up for just a minute. One minute, that's it. And if you're in high heels, I'm, I don't think anybody is. <laughs> I was going to say, take off your shoes. What the hell? Screws. <laughs> turn to a person, not the person you've been yabbering to for the last hour. Just turn to a person and just tell them one thing you're grateful for. Listen to one thing they're grateful for. Thank them and sit down, please. Go. Did it? Yeah, good. You can jump. <laughs> Thank you. Whoa. On your, on your four sources of energy. Did anybody go up? Did anybody go up on any one of the four sources? You feel Anybody feel more energy now? One minute later. Good. Anybody feel less energy? Okay. It can happen. It can happen. We'll talk about that at the break. Okay, what's going on here? We all wake up and we want to be high positive, high energy, positive energy. We're winners, right? We want to get out of bed and be really excited about what we're doing. And we generally are, even if you're a slow riser and you need three cups of coffee. It's okay. You are usually in an up positive mood. And what happens? You get to work. And as you work and people give you problems and you start to realize that it's not going the way you want to and now you have a deadline and it doesn't look like you're going to meet it and now people are not, not only not doing what you want, they're making mistakes and you have to fix it for them and then your kids start screaming and everybody's getting angry and you start getting angry but you're going to get this project done and you're going to work your hardest because you are fantastic, right? You're the only one around you who's fantastic and you know that, now you're in high negative energy and you're going to get it done. And if you work like that for week upon week and month upon month because you're on the Gutenberg Project or something even more important than that, you wake up one morning like this and now you're in low negative energy. And this is when you say, I don't think I'm going to get out of bed today. 
I hate my job. I think I'll quit. My kids can get their own breakfast. <laughs> the dog can walk itself. Lo now, if you're grieving or someone you know is very ill, you can be in low negative energy for quite some time. It's okay. There is no good or bad here. The only thing is you must go to low positive every 90 minutes if you can. No matter where you are on this map, you're having a fantastic team meeting. Take a moment, just a minute, to do gratitude. Take 10 minutes to go outside and breathe the air. Unless you're, well, take time to drink a glass of water. Whatever it is for you, do something that helps you recover. It is a responsibility. And in fact, think about what you could do every morning or every afternoon. Think about what's going to get in your way. Deadlines, people, people's calls. Think about who's going to help you or what's going to help you do it. You're going to set an alarm. You're going to do some, a ritual with your team so everybody takes a break at the same time. Whatever you have to do to practice recovery. And think about, most important of all, the mindset shift. Go back to the iceberg under the water. What will help you want to do this? I used to believe that if I could be Madame Curie, that would be the best thing in the world. Work myself to death and die on the streets of Paris. <laughs> A little radiation maybe. But, you know, that's okay. I worked to death. I thought that was the best thing in life. Now, let's not decompose what's wrong with me, but think about it. I had to shift that mindset to actually taking recovery time will make me more productive. I need to do it for my people because, frankly, nobody really wants to work with a high negative energy person, which I was most of the time. And if, think about what becomes possible for you if you do this, think about how much more of you can come to work or come to your life. This works in and out of work. That's called a recovery practice. It takes a while to build up a ritual. For some people, it's three weeks. For some people, it's six months of active, conscious work. But once you do this, it's pretty great. So I get up every hour and walk to the window and look out at the world, just love to do it. And then I come back to work feeling refreshed. What will you do? Because Joe says, we're out of time. <laughs> at the break, I hope you will take out of here one intention for yourself based on one of the five doors that we walked through today. One intention that you choose, consciously choose, and one action that you can take next week to start to live into that intention. If you want more, and I can't believe that you do, but I'm still active, you can find me at McKinsey. You can find me online. I have a friggin' beautiful WordPress site that was made to me uh, by Chris and Michelle. If you're in the audience, thank you very much. It's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. I just wish I knew how to update it. But <laughs> anybody can help me. I'm introverted and I'm learning. And instead, you can also find me on LinkedIn. And these are the books. You don't have to be a female to read the first one. Please, they're uh, the head of a major oil company in Europe read it and said, oh my God, I see myself in these women. Is there something wrong with me? And the point is, no, there's something right with him because we are all human beings and we all have the capacity to be these five, have these five capabilities. And if you do that, you are already awesome. You will be awesomer and you will have more energy, I promise you, and greater happiness. And I will not sell you the Brooklyn Bridge now, this stuff where I'm told no swearing. So this stuff <laughs> does work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>